Before moving to the panelists, I'd like to welcome back again to this year um, annual uh, for, for FinTech and Regulation Conference, Emmanuel uh, Givanakis. So, so Emmanuel is CEO of Abu Dhabi Financial Services Regulatory Authority, and he's going to make some introductory remarks. Um, Emmanuel, welcome. Thank you again for um, uh, you know, agreeing to spend some time with us to talk about uh, this time about risk management. Um, and um, you know, the, the floor is yours. Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen in Europe, and uh, greetings to attendees in the other regions around the world. By way of background, Abu Dhabi Global Market, uh, ADGEM for short, is an international financial centre here in uh, the United Arab Emirates, the capital city, um, which we launched in 2015. Uh, I'm the CEO of the Abu Dhabi Global Markets Regulator, the Financial Services Regulatory Authority, FSRA for short. And um, I'm here today to provide some opening thoughts uh, for this panel. My particular focus uh, will be on the potential transformation of uh, risk management and uh, supervisory practices through the uh, greater use of innovative technologies such as uh, RegTech and SubTech, respectively. Um, over recent years, regulators across the globe have uh, materially shifted their approach uh, to the wider fintech industry. Uh, to one of active support, as shown by initiatives such as regulatory sandboxes like ours. Uh, with uh, regard to RegTech and SubTech specifically, we're now on the, on the cusp of another technology-based uh, evolution. Um, whilst financial institutions um, have a history of refining uh, their risk management methodologies um, with the technology of the day, it is the power of uh, digital design um, underpinning RegTech in particular, that offers better outcomes uh, in these areas. Uh, the exponential growth of innovative technology, in particular uh, AI, uh, cloud infrastructure, um, API-driven connectivity, provides the tools uh, for RegTech and SubTech, for that matter. But the demand for it is born out of significant increase in, in essence, the volume, complexity and diversity of financial regulations over the last decade. So uh, RegTech solutions offer not only uh, to imitate manual regulatory processes, but they radically redesign them in a way that can be cost efficient, minimizes human error, importantly, and importantly for regulators, delivers the output in real time. So they're also potentially scalable in a way that can adapt to new challenges associated digital delivery of financial services. Already, just here in our own jurisdiction, we've seen a recognition of this power by regulators. So in 2020, um, the UAE supervisory authorities, including ourselves, consulted on encouraging firms to use RegTech to the fullest extent possible in order to maintain AML standards at a time when COVID restrictions made face-to-face -face customer due diligence very, very difficult. Just as a transformative, just as transformative, I should say, as RegTech is the use of innovative technology by regulators to supervise markets and firms more efficiently and effectively. On the explosion of available financial data, I'm reminded constantly um, of the comments um, the Bank of England supervisors received. In essence, the reading equivalent of twice the entire works of uh, William Shakespeare each week. To fully utilise this wealth of data that we're inundated with, supervisors must gradually adopt subtech solutions to undertake the heavy lifting of data analysis. Doing so will enable us uh, to proactively identify and mitigate the new risks that will undoubtedly emerge from untapped opportunities in a globally connected digital system. However, various hurdles have been highlighted that may hinder widespread adoption of RegTech and SubTech. A key one um, being perceptions of regulatory acceptance. So to give you an example, to provide an ADGM perspective, as a relatively young financial centre and young financial services regulator, we have had the opportunity to develop a fresh approach to engaging with the market on risk management and risk management innovation in particular. Like some of our peers, we've taken 
a forward-leaning stance on regtech, subtech and fintech more broadly, whilst ensuring we do not endorse any particular product, service or, for that matter, compliance methodology. This stance um, has led to the creation of our digital lab in April 2021. It provides a highly functional digital infrastructure for challenges to be raised and solutions to be tested by collaboration between institutions, innovation companies, and importantly, the regulator ourselves. Although not just RegTech focused, it has helped develop notable RegTech solutions, such as real-time monitoring of third-party service providers and provides regulatory oversight prior to any implementation. Elsewhere, we are continuing to work to digitise our regulatory framework to aid understanding and analysis of ever-evolving regulatory requirements. On the sub-tech side, uh, we've developed a, a market surveillance system for the monitoring of market abuse in ADGM, including, importantly, over our virtual asset multilateral trading facilities, which we have some here operational in our centre already. To raise the awareness of RegTech and SubTech, the FSRA published a report in November last year. We entitled that report, Powering the Future of Regulation. It describes our exploration of using this technology in ADGM via specific use cases and learning points with regard to RegTech and SubTech. With all this in mind, regulators like ourselves remain vigilant to the risk to customers, investors and financial stability that can emanate from adoption of innovative technology. Regulatory expectations of best practice will promote the need for robust risk management frameworks to support this adoption, particularly for data security, cyber risk and, importantly, outsourcing arrangements. I will close with a reference to the future skill set of financial regulators. Whilst technology innovation may not have been their traditional expertise, it is now clear that this cannot continue, reflecting the increase of tech-based recruitment in financial institutions um, is imperative. So therefore, regulators must attract and ret retain people that will be able to design and use subtech tools, understand the technology behind RegTech employed by regulated firms, and assess the risks accordingly relating to the wider fintech transformation of our industry. I'd like to thank you for your time today and I wish you a productive remainder of the conference and to enjoy this panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Emmanuel. Um, thank you for sharing your thoughts and um, experiences from uh, Abu Dhabi and you've made my job much easier as moderator now at setting the scene, so thank you. Have a good day. And with, with that, let me start now by introducing the panellists. Um, let me start with um, Audrey Blanc. Audrey is the Head of Digital Economy uh, Policy Division at the Directorate for Science, Technology and Innovation at the OECD in Paris. Welcome, Audrey. Um, uh, Lee uh, Shushan is the Head and Deputy Director of Artificial, Intelli Artificial Intelligence, Fintech and the in Innovation at the Monetary Authority of Singapore, the MAS. Uh, uh, welcome, good afternoon, uh, Lee. Um, Lucino uh, Brinkat, who's the Deputy Head of FinTech Supervision at Malta, or the Maltese Financial Services Authority. Welcome, um, Luciano. <clears throat> and then I've got um, Uwe uh, Klaproth, who's the Head of Group Risk Management at Euroclear. Um, and I think we've also now just got uh, to Tony CEO. So uh, good morning, Tony. Uh, Tony's head of marketplace regulatory technology at NASDAQ. Um, pretty, and, and appreciate you joining Tony, given you're based in New York. So um, uh, you're, you're excused for drinking more coffee than, than, than everyone uh, else uh, participating. Can I remind the audience please to, to put questions through um, using the Q&A function um, on, 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 the, um, on your screens. And perhaps I can start um, with, with you, Audrey. Uh, and I wonder if you could set the scene, sort of bigger picture around the adoption of new technology um, um, 
probably you know, given the OECD focus, that clearly goes beyond financial services. But 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 they the um, you know th these trends do do are relatively common across many sectors, uh, particularly around AI, AI, cloud, and data sharing. And I wonder if you could also share some thoughts around what's the catalyst for the work that the OECD have been doing around the adoption more generally of new technologies. Uh, well, thank you, Daniel, for having me. It's it, it's really nice to be here uh, with everyone today. Um, so yes, obviously the OECD's work on new and emerging technologies goes back for, for many decades actually. And I think um, in particular the last 10 to 15 years where we've seen a decrease in, um, in the cost of storage and computing capabilities leading to new technologies, new emerging technologies or new computing um, uh, trends such as artificial intelligence, machine learning, the deployment of sensors um, across the ecosystem, not just in um, in sort of consumer in the consumer space, but in the industrial space as well, has really led to uh, some policy and regulatory challenges faced by OECD member countries, but certainly more broadly around the world. And that's really led us to look at um, the trends around these emerging technologies. What are both the policy and regulatory issues that they pose, but also the broader economic opportunities and the social uh, value to be had in sort of trustworthy and responsible um, governance of, of this adoption of new technologies. So um, with regard, you know, specifically to artificial intelligence, which at the OECD, we we have a definition that we worked really hard to get consensus on across our countries and, and more broadly. Um, we, we define it as a machine learning system capable of influencing its environment by producing an output. Um, and there's different ways it can have um, a machine-based uh, input and output or human human intervention as well. Um, but, but this is a general purpose technology and we see its adoption across, uh, as you said, Daniel, many industrial sectors, uh, finance being one of them and maybe um, historically one of the earlier adopters of, of technology. And we, I'll, I'll say a little bit about why, you know, just some data to support the notion that we have seen a growth in the adoption of these technologies. So um, just, we look at things like uh, jobs and skills. We look at things like research publication and patents. And in all of those areas, uh, we've seen a huge uh, increase in, in research publications around uh, artificial intelligence, specifically in the financial sector as well, if you just take finance. Um, just the sum of venture capital investments and AI, AI startups for all sectors has increased over 28 fold since 2012 um, or between 2012 and 2020. So I suspect as we get new data for the last two years, we'll see that number go up uh, any uh, significantly more. Um, we've also seen that on the policy side, uh, government struggling to, um, to to not necessarily to catch up, but to also get ahead of some of the trends and a proliferation of policy initiatives, uh, regulatory initiatives, but also strategic initiatives out of countries. So um, we have a, an online platform called um, OECD.ai, uh, the policy observatory where we have a database of more than 700 policy initiatives across 60 countries focused on AI. Um, and these, these initiatives are trying to both promote the adoption of this broad technology, as well as uh, mitigate risks. And so that brings me to the point uh, and the importance of, of data uh, and data sharing, which, which you mentioned as, as your third topic. Obviously, as technology has diffused across our economies, um, more data is, is being produced, personal data, non-personal data. Um, and this has raised huge opportunities. It's one of the reasons that we see AI accelerating and machine learning applications diffusing across different sectors, um, but it's also raised challenges uh, in terms of how do we protect the data, how do we um, create a, a, a fair structure both economically and socially to use that data to meet um, sort of broader objectives, whether it's addressing climate change issues or implementing um, uh, tax compliance regimes, for example. Um, so it's, it, it's, it's, it's a strong recognition across our countries that data is a resource. It's, it's an important resource for our economies and societies, but it has to be governed and it has to be at least shared in a trustworthy way. And so um, we have several initiatives at the OECD to try to understand better the value that data plays in our different um, 
uh, for our economies, both both just purely economically speaking, but also in terms of the social value to be derived from data. Um, and the, the role that it plays in advancing technological development more broadly. Um, I think all of these trends are enabled by um, you know, the emergence of, of, again, better computing capabilities, as you see with cloud computing, the ability to the, the reduce cost and things like storage and, and compute overall, um, as well as you know, long-term investment that governments have made in research and development, as well as um, uh, productization. Um, so with that, I, I'll, I'll turn it back to you, Daniel. I hope that was what you were, yes. were hoping for. Thank Very you. Very good. Thank you, Audrey. So, so <clears throat> Lee, Lee um, <clears throat> good afternoon. Maybe I can come to you now. So, so if I think of the um, MAS sort of core functions around supervision, um, you, know, you need to ensure that, that the financial um, institutions that you supervise have got a comprehensive risk management process, ultimately mitigate the risks properly. Uh, and on a timely basis. So, so how does the MAS now look at risk management for the, for, the, for the institutions that you supervise, given the trends we've just heard around AI? And to what extent is risk management now inherently different? Um, and, and, and again, as a supervisor, how do you drive, you know, this isn't an issue of just ticking a box. So how do you drive through the changes to the financial institutions around governance, oversight, accountability? Well, thank you, thank you, Daniel. Yeah, maybe I just uh, give a, a brief introduction about uh, MES journey on the on these areas. Around the three plus years ago, MES first announced a principle called FEAT, F-E-A-T, stands for Fairness, Ethics, Accountability, and Transparency. This guidance is provided to the financial institutions to, um, to use AI responsibly. And uh, this is our first step. Uh, after we announced the feed principles, uh, we received a lot of feedback from the financial institutions. And uh, they told us uh, how to implement the feed principles is very challenging. Give you some example, how to define what is the fairness for different use cases from a fraud detection to customer marketing. Uh, how to um, de de decide the threshold, which uh, say this uh, credit loan is uh, fair or not fair. And, next, and what is the transparency methodology should be, be used to evaluate the AI system? And how much transparency should they provide to internal or external stakeholders? And how to set up a proper ethics governance, especially around the AI and machine learning within the organization? These are all very challenging and practical issues when they adopt or try to implement the feed principle. And due to this reason, our second step is around two years ago, we set up a called a Veritas Consortium together with the industry. Nowadays, it is uh, have uh, 20 plus members from uh, financial institutions, uh, uh, global consulting firms, uh, top AI firms such as Microsoft, Google, etc. So the goal of this uh, Veritas Consortium is to develop a concrete methodology and the tooling so that the financial institutions can use them to really implement or integrate the feed principles. And oh, I'm very happy just uh, last week, we announced the second uh, uh, Veritas phase two finish and uh, five white paper has been published. You can find it online. So in short, in the white paper, we provide a very concrete, uh, like a checklist type of uh, uh, framework so that the users, FIs, can use them to implement the feed principle. We also provide the free open source tools, softwares, which implement the various methodology so that the banks or the fintech firms can implement the various using this tooling as a library or as a software within their product or their organization. I think this is step two, what we are doing now at this moment, which is provide methodology and also provide the tooling for the IFIs and the FinTech to implement the feed principle. And this year, we will focus on make this happen, meaning focus on how to build up the uh, Veritas or feed ecosystem. This meaning we will provide a lot of training free webinar to our you know singapore financial practitioners and also oversee um, practitioners we will provide um, we <clears throat> excuse me we will provide the support for the ifis 
who will in, implement the Veritas and integrate uh, them into their current operating systems. We will collaborate with the tech firms, big tech firms or fintech, so that they can implement the methodology and the software within their product or services. So by doing so, we hope we can help the whole financial sector really to make AI governance happen within their product or their organization. I think this is our step journey, three-step journey in the last few years on Q today. Yeah. Just, just one, one follow-up, which I think you're probably a beneficiary. <clears throat> um, Emmanuel spoke about the composition of skills of uh, regulators. How's that changed in the um, MAS? And I'm going to ask Luci Luciano this, que this same question um, in, in a moment, but I just wondered why you have the, the, the floor. Uh, so you asked me how, uh, let me yeah. rephrase your question, how within MAS we skill up our skills on these areas, correct? E exactly. Okay, um, we provide regularly training to our supervisors who have no strong technical background on AI or new technology. Okay, for example, last year, I think I provided at least a two or three from very fundamental training about what is AI, what are the use cases of AI, what are the potential risks around the ADA system? And the second, this is a basic AI training for our supervisors. And the second, we provide AI governance training, which is uh, we explain our training, uh, provide to our supervisors, what is the feed? What is the various methodology? How it could be implemented within the IFIs? Mm -hmm. This is mm -hmm. Second. Okay. And, and the number three within MAS, actually our, our own IT department and the related department also try to implement uh, a feed and the virtus so that our own ADA system from super tech perspective also have a proper governance so that uh, when we you know talk with I5, we can say we also implement it within our uh, MAS. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. So, so Luciana, if I can now now turn to you, and, and I, I think it's um, it, it's really sort of picking up on some of these issues about um, how the uh, the um, MSFA addressing the needs of the financial sector to, of the future, but bo both in terms of the sort of supervisory capacity, but also performing key functions. And I, I, I maybe this question's a little bit um, uh, difficult, but it. It's interesting that, you know, if I look at some of the supervisors who seem to be, or, 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 or supervisor authorities that seem to be punching above their weight, they tend to be smaller countries, Abu Dhabi, Singapore, Malta. And, and I wonder, any, any thoughts you have um, around if, that, if that's just pure coincidence or, you know, maybe, maybe you're just more and more focused around these issues? So good morning, everyone. Thanks, Daniel, for, for the interesting question. And thanks for having the MFSA contributed towards this interesting discussion. Um, as you rightly mentioned, uh, the Motor Financial Services Authority has been um, very focused on fintech and on, uh, on implementing a technology-driven um, approach towards the supervision of, of, of uh, the financial services market locally. When we discuss the effective risk management of, of AI, uh, cloud computing, and the data technology, um, there are two perspectives as regulators. The first perspective is that of um, how this is being adopted within the local financial services market, and uh, the needs, the challenges, and the gaps which are arising. Uh, and as regulators, it's our obligation to see that there is sustainable growth in the financial services market, and therefore, our first um, approach towards effective risk mitigation there is, is through identifying the risk to the, to the firm, the risk to the clients, and the risk to the market. And once we do that, we obviously um, adopt the, the necessary policy initiatives and the policy incentives to direct the market accordingly. And um, in this respect, as a, as, a, as a European jurisdiction, we also have um, European frameworks, which, which uh, obviously we fall under. And in this respect, with respect to, for example, AI, uh, the European Commission has just recently launched its, its AI Act, which obviously deals with the adoption of AI within, within the European um, community, as well as what we should 
um, prohibit in terms of AI. And this act is, is um, an act which does not solely cover financial services, but it covers a lot of sectors. But um, it's, it's, it's financial services has been um, highlighted as a, one of the main high risk areas uh, within the context of AI. Obviously, in view of the uh, impact that financial services have on, 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 the, on the consumer. With respect to cloud computing, there is also the Digital Operations Resilience Act, the proposed business by the Commission last, last September. And this act basically, which is, is moving forward, um, is very important as it establishes the common groundwork, the common, a common understanding of what we expect the industry to have in so far as um, ICT arrangements um, to ensure that there is digital operation resilience and that, the, and that there is no risk and that the risk to the market is, is effectively mitigated. Obviously, when we discuss data technologies, um, it, is, um, it is very relevant to the payment space. And, and this is what the retail payment strategy, which, which the Commission presented, um, is very relevant in view that there is a push for lowering data fragmentation and lower and increasing data mobility towards um, of financial data. So as regulators, our role here is to, is to obviously, um, as much as possible, um, promote and maximize the benefits of these technologies within our obviously local jurisdictions and obviously within the, within the global uh, context, whilst obviously mitigating the risk uh, emanating from these technologies. That said, and as you rightly mentioned, um, being a, a small regulator um, has its own challenges, um, even more so when considering that these technologies cross boundaries. And uh, obviously, um, as a regulator, we had to change uh, the culture and our approach towards the, these technologies. And um, in that space, we, have, we, we obviously are focusing on enhancing our supervisory capacity um, we obviously have horizontal functions which are specifically dealing with these concepts, um, such as geopolitical resilience, fintech, digital finance. And we also have um, new tools in place, such as uh, regular sandbox um, and innovation office. And, and these tools are very much important to identify the risks within the financial services market and, and, and the respective gaps which are emerging. So it, it is like the a first line of defense for, for the regulator. Additionally, um, we, are, we are also looking at the competence of a regulator. What does a regulator, uh, how, what should the regulator know and be exposed to? And uh, what, should his, what should his background be, you know? And um, should he be focused solely on financial services? Should he have a background in AI, in, in cloud computing? Um, and this is what, um, the horizontal functions uh, seek to achieve. So we have experts on cloud computing, experts on, on, on AI, which are focusing on these topics. Additionally, and as mentioned by, and as mentioned by my colleagues uh, and in, even the introductory um, remarks, um, regulators, such as ourselves as well, um, have to make use of, su of supervisory technology. Um, obviously, with, with the emergence of, of these technologies and and with uh, their use case being um, blurring the lines between jurisdictions, it is important that the data that we capture through supervisory reporting is uh, utilized to, 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 to enhance supervisory effectiveness and to reduce uh, the regulatory burden of, of, of our work, obviously, on the financial services market. And in that vein, we have actually established a a horizontal function as well on focusing on, on data quality and business intelligence. And uh, the, the aim there is to establish uh, common data definitions, a common data framework for the authority, and obviously to um, embark on a digital transformation which allows for the integration of other supervisory technology within our supervisory processes. So, Ultimately, um, as a small jurisdiction and as a, and as, as a small regulator uh, dealing with a, a global world, um, I believe that um, focusing on having the right frameworks in place, having the right supervisory tools in place, 
as well as collaborating with our international partners, at both at European level and at international level, it, it, it is only then that we can actually uh, seek to mitigate effectively the risks uh, emanating from these technologies. Back to you, Daniel. Thank you. That, that, that's that's very good. And it's good. I think it's good that you picked up on the the organisational element of how an organisation organises itself in in this in this respect. Um, Uwe, if I could come to you, please. Now, at, at um, sort of perspective around Euroclear, how has Euroclear's risk management adapted in light of new technologies, and and how difficult it is to put in place adequate controls uh, as a consequence, um, and just picking up on, on, on some of the earlier discussion, um, how has your governance and oversight process changed? And, and maybe just on the last issue, because I think, I think it might be important for a global firm, is um, the culture of regulators. Um, what's your observations around this cultural shift that, that, that really we've heard from, from the um, three uh, panellists around um, uh, you know, uh, uh, adapting to the new world? Uh, th thanks, Daniel. Uh, happy, happy to pick that up. Um, I think it's interesting questions uh, you've asked. Um, taking into account all the latest developments on the regulatory side, we just heard on the technology side. Within risk management, you always have to bridge the gap between regulatory needs, business needs, and technology evolution. So it's, it's always, uh, no matter what you do in risk management, it's always uh, a challenge. So, and it's not an easy one. And um, to find the right balance all the time. But uh, let me start with, uh, with uh, the governance question. I think it's, it's the uh, top-down um, approach. I think we are using at Euroclear uh, enterprise risk management system um, that's covering all types of risk, like strategic risks, operational risks, and so on. So pretty straightforward. And to cover topics like uh, data and the like, we have dedicated frameworks in place to deal with that. So that means we have recently, for example, renewed our technology risk management framework uh, to cover the latest regulatory uh, developments, for example. So anticipating already uh, regulations like DORA that's uh, ahead of us, uh, should come next one and a half or two years, hopefully. Keep the fingers crossed. I count on you, my dear panelists, to make that happen in the European space. And uh, But from a pure governance perspective, we have several layers uh, of detail of frameworks and supporting documents for sure. Uh, it's a common approach in the industry and starting with the supervisory um, perspective, ending up with the workforce perspective. That means we always aim to have the precise and pragmatic enough approach for the target group we want to um, approach with this governance framework. And um, if you're not pragmatic or precise enough sometimes, these frameworks would never land. So they're paper-based exercise only, but never been embedded. Uh, and this is really a key. Embedding frameworks is the key to bring it to life. What uh, regulators have in mind, what technology have in mind, what um, business has in mind, it needs to land with every single person in the company and put it to life. And this is the difficult part. Yeah? Writing is the easy part. Embedding is the more difficult one going forward. And uh, going forward in the governance and oversight, I think they need to be in place and they are in place. But fair to say, before all these big changes or evolutions kicked in with AI, big data, cloud and the like, governance was a bit more easy. Yeah? Um, because you have usually um, a very senior group in, in governance and senior management. And, um, but they are not necess necessarily being um, well equipped for all the new risks we are facing in the market or in, in the global world. So therefore we have adapted ac accordingly. So we have uh, in risk committees, uh, we have now um, created, for example, additional governance, that means subcommittees and the like, dealing with cloud, dealing with cyber risk, security and, and the like, because having there, they are very senior persons, but specialists. And these persons then, preparing decisions and for the higher governance structure in, in the company for them to be prepared to take decisions based on the analysts uh, analysis of the lower governance on cloud security and the like. So therefore we really want to prepare our senior management accordingly. And that's now the governance we have chosen for that. But uh, as I said, uh, 
that doesn't mean that uh, senior management can delegate the risks or the um, uh, uh, yeah or the accountability downwards. No, it stays there. <laughs> so it's it's only delegated for analysis and and preparation, but not uh, for decision making. Um, as you can imagine, all these evolutions on the regulatory side and uh, technology is still continuing. So this work is continuously ongoing, being refreshed, like EBA guidelines even indicate to have an ongoing continuous improvement cycle with these governance documents and the like, just to be um, aware and, and be um, always been ahead of that. You mentioned as well um, about the the attitude, the cultural shift uh, of the regulator, regulatory bodies um, uh, globally. And I think, yes, I've seen, observed as well, a shift, a positive mind shift that took place, uh, being more adaptable, being more approachable regarding of new technologies, and as a downside, being more um, curious what the companies are doing. So therefore, um, having now more questions by regulators, uh, how do you tackle this, how tackle that? And this is then, it's a, necessi it's a necessity, um, but it needs to be prepared well as well. Because um, in this special regard, I think uh, Lee mentioned it uh, very uh, nicely before, um, he and his um, um, regulatory body is doing a lot of trainings, waves, onboarding companies step by step and, and the like. And this is really appreciated. All the, um, uh, the initiatives OCD is doing in harmonizing all these regulations we are seeing, uh, OCD and the CPMR, YOSCO and the like. But fair to say as well, we still see um, or observe a different speed uh, within the regulatory bodies as well. We see very advanced ones and we see less advanced ones. And this does not uh, uh, have necessarily to be um, uh, uh, according to the size of the regulator, like uh, Luciano, you mentioned you are a small regulator in, in Malta. It doesn't have to be up to the size if you be quick or slow. Yeah, e even the, the slowest one can be quick, uh, can be big and, and the like. Yeah. So um, this is for me really important to see um, how governance uh, can be uh, keep up to speed as well in that, and to harmonize as well the speed they they are progressing together jointly to have everything in place done. Because for me, this is a, a, a key risk I see as a, a company risk manager, wearing my mm. corporate hat now, is um, the workforce in, in general. Eh? Um, going forward, um, you all recognize the shortage on the labor market, on skilled persons uh, for cyber, AI, you name it. And it's hard for industry to get the right people attracted to the company and more importantly, to keep them. And I can only imagine how hard it could be for a regulatory body as well to approach the right people and to keep them happy and in place for, for longer. So therefore, I think this is a, a real challenge going forward. What I see as a key risk uh, as, a, as a joint European um, uh, uh, community on that. And uh, you asked me about controls, Daniel, as well. How do yes. you all that? Um, that's, that's a tough one. Um, we have in place a strong governance, strong governance bodies with strong risk assessments done by a first line of defense, second line of defense, and then validated or uh, checked or audited by the third line of defense. So that's, that's in general terms, a very strong control framework already, but we're using for sure things like a, a NIST directive, uh, we're using all the CAS top 20s and, and alike what you can, only can imagine on, on the world. But still, uh, it remains a continuous challenge um, as technology is evolving. And, um, and especially, this brings questions up to my mind. How to tackle the black box risk? Yeah? How to tackle um, the self-developing code? Yeah? How to tackle um, uh, the question how far we can trust AI decisions? Yeah? Who is accountable in the end? How far do we go to test and, and, to, and, and to validate and, and to ensure? Yeah? Or what kind of risk we're going to take. And on that, I think this is a topic where we all need to have guidance and discussions with the regulatory bodies um, to, to have a joint approach. So because this is, we cannot solve by its own industry. Yeah? We could, but then we would have a, a wild west again, uh, as we had in the beginning of, of blockchain, for example. And I think these, these days has gone, in my view. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. I, I think, I mean, it's on the banking side, but I think Honoré and Ria um, has been very um, adamant about um, the banks that they supervise having the right capabilities at the top of the bank for, for uh, understanding technology and data. The problem, as you say, is that there are only so many you know, good people. Um, so um, thank you. T T Tony, if I could come to you, please, um, now. Um, I want to change tact slightly um, to talk about partnerships uh, initially with you, about um, partnerships between FS firms and uh, technology firms, more particularly the cloud. Um, wh why are such partnerships important? And I guess following on from the points we've just heard, does NASDAQ experience very different attitudes around supervisors around the globe? Because I guess like you, you, um, Euronext, you'll be um, subject to sort of various sort of college arrangements where a lot of your decisions will potentially be joint. Uh, yes, exactly, Daniel. Uh, I think NASDAQ's in a fairly unique position here. Right? NASDAQ is obviously we're a regulated entity ourselves as exchange, right? And we have exchange, we operate exchanges globally. We're also, you would say, a regulator as well of, of entities that trade on our exchange, right? So we're both, we're on both sides. And then on top of that, NASDAQ's also a fairly significant technology provider of market infrastructure, as well as anti-financial crime software to banks, exchanges, and regulators as well, right? So this gives us a fairly unique position to kind of see kind of all sides of the group. Uh, and I, would, I really kind of, I agree with most of what people have said on this panel, and I, I really kind of find it really interesting, the kind of the group technologies that we've mentioned here, uh, and these kind of are a group of technologies that are very, are moving kind of very quickly uh, and developing very fastly in this space. And one, I think, interesting aspect is that those three groups of technologies that we mentioned, they intersect quite fundamentally, right? And quite frequently, what we're really talking about uh, from a regulatory perspective and a risk perspective is really not just any each of these technologies in kind of uh, isolation, but really intersection of <clears throat> AI using big data on the cloud, Really, really I, I think that's really what we're talking about here for a lot of these technologies. And I, I thought I'd give a few kind of examples as well in terms of how NASDAQ's using it just to, uh, and then some of the challenges we're facing. So for example, from an AI perspective, we've been using AI in our surveillance technology, surveillance marketplaces, as well as in our anti-money laundering technologies as well from an anti-money laundering perspective. And the way we use AI in these spaces is very much task-based, right? So there'll be, so for example, there'll be a specific task such as we need to better score or rank or uh, prioritize uh, the events or uh, behaviors that we're finding. And we're using AI to better score and rank and prioritize that behavior for the team. And then we have multiple projects that work for specific tasks, right? And this is something I think regulators also need to kind of understand as well. It's that we really kind of reached that point where you, it's very hard to say, okay, this is how AI is used in a company. AI tends to be used in kind of certain very focused specific tasks, which have quite different risk profiles, right? Um, and this is kind of something, at least from a NASDAQ perspective, that we've tried to be proactive about and recognize. So fairly early on, uh, as we have been developing these technologies, uh, we recognize the additional sensitivities around this, this kind of this space. Uh, we actually have an AI ethics board uh, that we run on a regular basis. Uh, we spent, and I kind of I emphasize of Audrey there, we spend an inordinate amount of time um, trying to work out a definition of AI, which was which is kind of crazy. Um, and then we spent a very large amount of time working through the principles for NASDAQ in terms of what are the principles we should be for using AI within the company. All right, so we developed a set of principles for AI, which pull upon a lot of things that have been done out there as well, but for us take a specific a little bit more of a financial services marketplace slant, right? And kind of pull in what are NASDAQ's uh, kind of goals as well. Is it possible just to give us an example of that? I mean, I, I could conceptualize sort of 
a key policy issue on the insurance side or a bank side about the extension of credit or insurance. But but for an exchange, what what will be a key AI sort of ethical issue? Um, so I think a lot of the kind of key ones are sounds around transparency, uh, fairness, accessibility. Those are key, I would say, across a lot of AI projects. For, for marketplaces, uh, around market efficiency and market fairness, right, are also key aspects as well. There is a goal as a marketplace for the markets to both be efficient and fair. That's an overarching goal that we have in a lot of our technologies. And then from an AI perspective, it, it's something that we need to look at how do we incorporate that. Um, so we, and then as I mentioned before, it's we also don't want to unduly burden the particular uh, development teams with an undue governance burden for their projects, right? So the actual potential AI risk of that project is important as well, right? So we have projects which are much more internal facing, which projects that impact um, clients or kind of investors, right? And then we kind of those different types of projects have different types of prioritization. Uh, and then I would say, uh, as I mentioned before, it's, uh, we, it is really about that intersection. So very recently, NASDAQ announced a partnership with AWS. Uh, from a cloud perspective, we have moved a large number of our technologies, both that we use and that we provide onto the cloud. Uh, and then from a risk and surveillance perspective, uh, we have also kind of moved a lot of these kind of surveillance and risk technologies to the cloud as well. Uh, and it's, it's really, we've seen a, from a regulated perspective, a much greater adoption kind of of those kind of particular, that kind of cloud-based technology compared to uh, where it was quite a few years ago. And I would say a lot of that is due to a greater understanding among risk regulators, what is the specific potential risk, right? And the assessment of that risk, right? Uh, so very recently, uh, we started a cloud-based surveillance uh, project with the Financial Markets Authority in New Zealand, but right? just to give you an example of the kind of greater regulatory uptake. And then from a data perspective, th th there is the, I suppose, the big data concept. And I, and I, I think this is kind of, that's something that's been discussed a fair bit. I, I, I think something that's particularly interesting with this intersection of technologies is around data sharing. Right, and I think this is something that, from a regulatory perspective, greater guidance can really support. So I'll, I'll provide an example. So we have we provide technologies to a group of banks, and you mentioned colleges, Daniel. And that's kind of a good example of that. We provide technologies to a group of banks around uh, anti-money laundering. Uh, we also provide technologies around surveillance. We have kind of fairly limited capabilities to share that the individual data across those pools, right? Uh, but if there were paths for greater data sharing, then using cloud, using AI, I think will be kind of, kind of great abilities for to improve the tools to detect those patterns of kind of bad behavior by anti-financial crime, right? But I think to be able to do that uh, effectively, right, with our clients, we, we, it, it does need greater kind of regulatory guidance um, and kind of cooperation and understanding uh, across jurisdictions as well. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Tony. That, that's uh, really insightful. Um, Lee and Luciano, I wonder if I could just g give either of you an opportunity now to come back on anything that's been said from, our, uh, from, from, from the industry around culture, um, around the sort of the, the partnerships. And I think the data ethics is the, uh, and, and AI is, is something we didn't really touch on um, initially. Yeah, um, I, so I, I can talk first if okay. Yeah, um, I think we, at least I, I personally fully believe in this area, especially it's uh, involving new technology, uh, new use cases coming and evolving. I think industry collab collaboration between the industry and the regulator are extremely important. I think that's a, that is a why we create uh, the Veritas as an industry collaboration project instead of MES, define what you should do and announce to the industry. 
but we discuss with the industry, understand their limitation, understand their difficulties, and work together with uh, you know the AI firms or academy to find out the best way for the proper AI governance. Okay, I think that is very, very important. I think a second thing to me is important, equally important is building up the ecosystem. That's not one of the panel list mentioned. There is just such a pool around AI or AI governance or, or technology. Okay, industry needed, regulator needed. How to solve it? Okay, I have recently talked with a lot of banks in Singapore. They told me, the money, the funding is not the top issue at, at this moment. We surveyed around 100 plus banks recently, and 90% of them told me they have the plan in the next three years, or they are ready to implement AI. But their biggest challenge is talent. So what I'm saying just now is, we should together to grow the talent, to build up the ecosystem, more and more people equipped with the latest technology to understand risk, to understand the air governance, then this can solve, hopefully, the issue for both IFIs and regulators. Without talent, I think it is impossible. That's my two cents. Thank you. Thank you. Luciano? I totally agree with, with Lee on this. Um, I believe that regulators mostly lack um, in terms of understanding of what, where the industry is and where the industry wants to go. So having the right understanding of, um, we're never gonna be at the level of the industry, but at least we can try to understand what the needs are, where the risks are, and at least try to foresee where it might go. You know, And, and this is why we have um, innovation offices, this is why we have and sandboxes, this is why we have various fora at, at both European and international level, which are focusing on, on, on innovative technology and emerging technology. And uh, it's true, it's, it's only through collaboration that we'll effectively deal with, with, these, with these sort of technologies and, and their adoption both within the regulator within, within, and um, within the industry. So, but another issue that we face, and I, and I, I think that this is very uh, prevalent in most regulators, is also the uh, behavioral change aspect, it's the cultural change aspect. So, it's uh, as regulators, we tend to be quite conservative, we tend to focus on, on, on the risks most of the time, uh, when in effect, it's our obligation to the, to the market is ultimately is to um, foster sustainable growth whilst trying to minimize the risks of, of new innovative uh, technologies. So, uh, and this is not easy because usually um, the governance structures in, in, within an organization, within the authorities, within, within financial authorities, tend to focus on uh, risk mainly, you know. But, um, so uh, um, as part of our mandate, in fact, as, as a fintech supervision function is to push and champion uh, fintech internally, and to um, pro not pr promote and uh, promote um, the definitions internally. So we, we try to reach out to our partners um, within the different supervisory functions to understand what they're looking at and what they require for them to understand. Um, additionally, um, and as mentioned by, by Lee and, and, and the previous speakers, we're also reaching out to the industry um, through uh, stakeholder panels and trying to uh, integrate those panels within our um, governance arrangements. So, trying to see how they can how, how they can contribute to the discussion internally within the organization. Obviously, uh, maintaining arm, an, an arm's length relationship. Back to you, Danny. Okay, thank you, um, Ube. Can I come back to, to to one of the issues that you've raised, and I think it's been touched on by by others. So, so please, uh, others. Uh, feel free to, to share your thoughts. But I think you talked a little bit around the challenges practically of implementation of different regulatory frameworks. Um, <clears throat> noticeably, you know, um, <clears throat> one, one is the actual regulation and then there's a the sort of the supervisory part uh, on the back of that. How do you try and overcome that? 
uh, as, as, you know, a, um, I don't know how many markets uh, that, that you're actually physically in, um, but, but how do you overcome those challenges, particularly when, you, when you're looking at risk management? Uh, th thanks, Daniel. How to overcome these challenges? Well, it's challenging. <laughs> <laughs> Life would be boring if it wasn't. <laughs> exactly. Now, um, uh, as we rightfully mentioned, um, uh, working for a company dealing with multiple jurisdictions uh, all the time, it uh, can become a challenge, especially uh, when uh, you need to deal with regulation that is sometimes even um, contradicting each other. So, but you're dealing in both markets. So you need to almost to have more two entities or something like that to somehow stay still in line. So I really appreciate, for example, the, the, the efforts doing, uh, done by, by OCD, CPMI and the like to, to get the alignment, the harmonization, the, uh, just the idea of the mind shift towards harmonization is a big step forward. Yeah? And, um, but uh, uh, there's always a little but on, on that, a little uh, pitfall is uh, in my view um, that whenever common regulation is published, uh, it usually has still to be translated into national uh, regulation. Um, and even if not needed, it's always then um, up to the national competent authority to interpret the common legislation. So in the end, uh, in the worst case, you end up in Europe again with one central legislation and 17 different interpretations of that. So this is an, another thing we need, need to work on. For me, that would be a level two of the harmonization we work in level one at the moment at, at a big scope, but level two would be excellent being there somewhere. This, this is the biggest uh, challenge we have. And additionally to that, uh, just to add a bit uh, more into that uh, complexity is, yes, we have regulation, we have legislation, but on top we have as well industry standards like, uh, like a SWIFT CSP, for example, what is not mandatory, but some legislators take that as a prerequisite for something else. And, and, and the like. Yeah? So therefore, it's sometimes a bit, um, yeah, sorry, still challenging. So we do our very best to, um, we run assessments uh, corporate-wide to see where do we have the um, overlapping parts of all the legislation we need to apply, where do we have the gaps or the contradicting parts. And then uh, as soon as we cover or discover a gap or um, something that's contradicting each other, we proactively reach out uh, to the uh, respective regulators to, to really to, to, to seek the discussion and the advice. Usually, I have to admit, usually the regulators are very um, thankful for pointing out special things. And then you have usually a very good discussion on, on that. Yeah? So that's that's how we tackle these, these kind of things. Because there is no um, silver bullet. Uh, there is no uh, magic solution. It's always about talking and finding agreements. And uh, what I've discovered as well, the more you analyze, the better you're prepared for these discussions, uh, the more fact-based you are, the easier it is to find a solution going forward because uh, 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 regulatory bodies as well, yes, they are competent, they, they develop these things, they interpret, but they're human beings as well. They are not Superman neither. Yeah? So, uh, uh, and if you don't cover our white spots, it's each other, would end up with a fisher net uh, with a lot of spots in there so therefore we need to see to work together jointly on that it, it, it's a it's a give and take in mm -hmm. thank you and anyone else uh, any any thoughts on that if not um uh audrey maybe i can just just come back to you slightly um uh, the the um what one of the the, the areas that that uh that, that has changed in terms of the, um, the the risks, I would say, over the last 10 years are around um, data privacy and cyber. Um, and, I, and I wonder the extent to which the, the OECD is focused on that. Now, I, I think the other thing that, you know, I, I know it's not within your directorate, but this skills part that, that has come up, you know, no matter where the panelists are located in the world, um, uh, I, I imagine the OCD are very focused on skills and, and, and how you do that. Have, have, have you, where, where have your colleagues come out on sort of best practice to, to, um, to try and increase the stock of um, people coming out with the, the skills that are going to be in high demand going forward? 
Thanks, Daniel. Um, I just want it's to, it's a great opportunity for me to plug an upcoming um, conference in two weeks uh, that is done in cooperation um, with the German Ministry of Labor and our colleagues in employment, labor, and social affairs here at the OECD, which are sort of the the labor experts and we're the digital experts. And then we have our education experts. And this it's, it's, it's a conference we call AI WIPs. It's actually a big program looking specifically at the effect of AI in the workplace on skills um, and productivity and innovation. Um, and uh, so you can Google AI WIPs. Uh, so there's gonna be a lot of discussion specifically about the OECD's work on um, understanding uh, the skills gap with regard to AI, um, the, the reskilling of workforce. So there's a lot of focus here on how do we reskill res our existing workforce to, to account for the digital transformation, but particularly with regard to AI. Um, and so I would, I would recommend this particular um, dialogue. It's extremely well, attended, but also um, to look at some of our ongoing work that is associated with that program, um, which is very cross cutting across the OECD. Again, it tries to bring forward our digital expertise with our um, the folks that understand the education environment and then the folks understand employment and, and skills issues. I would say that on our AI observatory, we are looking at jobs and skills. Um, we have data. Uh, self some of most of it's self-reported data through um, LinkedIn or um, uh, uh, GitHub and other places where we look at on the LinkedIn side specifically, um, what kind of skills uh, employees are reporting needing in the digital age. And so if you look, you can break it down by AI, you can break it down by country. Um, so there's a lot of interesting ways to look at the trends, particularly with regard to the, de the high demand for skills um, or the, the set of skills we think of as going into AI. So the coding, the particular program programming languages that are associated with machine learning and artificial intelligence. And I think, you know, it's not it's not unusual for us to hear what many of colleagues here have said today, which is that the, one of their biggest problem is just human capacity and um, and skills uh, at the high end, but also sort of we also do focus on sort of skills at the sort of user and consumer end as well. Um, uh, on the topic of data privacy and security, I think um, it, it's, a, it's an excellent point. And yes, the, the OECD has been a longstanding um, contributor, I think, to the international space on, on data, data privacy and data policy more broadly, dating back to the what we call our privacy guidelines um, of 1980, which have obviously been updated since then, but we're really the first intergovernmental approach to, to data privacy. And they are the, the harmonizing fundamental principles of most data protection laws around the world, well beyond the OECD. Um, you know, and, and so I think some of the challenges of today where we're trying to advance are looking at how do we apply some of these uh, uh, concepts and principles to um, the emerging areas of, um, of a sort of data sovereignty, the desire for countries to have um, sort of at least interoperable or equal treatment of data protection across regimes beyond just you know a data protection law um, per se and so we're trying to do we're doing quite a lot of work around the interoperable of, of the interoperability of data protection policies and laws to try to draw more commonality so that data can be shared um, in a more trustworthy or at least a, a freer manner. And I don't mean that in terms of monetary freedom, but in terms of sort of regulatory um, freedom. Um, but I think these are, they're quite profound issues and in a way that is um, perhaps different than 20 years ago, we see a merging of issues that are traditionally regulatory and traditionally, you know, um, issues of the state or issues of the government with issues of the companies and issues of, of national security and, and, and law enforcement. So one area that the OECD is working on right now is to try to to draw common approaches to how our, our law enforcement and national security apparatuses and our governments access people's data when it's held by the, the private sector, which is a, a big area of, of uh, where trust is lacking and, and a barrier, a potential barrier to, to data flows. Um, so, so all of that to say that, you know, we have a really strong foundation 
um, at the OECD. And our job here is really to try to bring countries together to, to advance interoperability on, on how these things apply in, in, in the really big moving world where you have so much data, so much need for data, and you know a, a sort of knee-jerk sort of protectionist reaction in some parts of the world to sort of hoard data, keep data, keep it from moving, either for privacy reasons, for industrial policy reasons, for national security reasons. There's all sorts of legitimate reasons. But um, the way I think our view is that the way to to promote that is to understand those reasons and draw comparable, interoperable, harmonized approaches across at least like-minded um, countries that share a sort of basic uh, approach to, 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 to the rule of law and, and how we regulate our economies. Thank you. <clears throat> um, we, we, we've got about five minutes left. So I think what I will do, I'm gonna ask one question um, to, to on, on, on the industry side and then one on the supervisory side, um, almost to conclude, but also give you, um, uh, give the four of you just an opportunity just to pick up on anything that's um, uh, not, not been raised so far. And so if I start with um, uh, Tony and um, uh, Uwe, I, I think, you know, I think the issue for me would be um, what's your sort of priority number one for what you would like from the, the public sector. And I mean, both, you know, in some senses that could be legislators or policymakers, but particularly supervisors. If you, if you could have a wish, what would it be that, that would allow your organization to essentially be more effective at managing risk? And then I think um, for Luciano and um, Lee, um, the, the, to what extent, and, and, and I'll give you the opportunity then to come back on if there's anything raised there, but to what extent actually are the risks now different? Um, and, um, uh, you know, therefore the, the, the mitigants have to be different. And is, is there a risk that in sort of incumbent financial services organisations, um, they are less able to adapt as a consequence, because one of the things that, that's been apparent is that the geographical and sectorial boundaries are blurring <clears throat> significantly. And we see that through a company like NASDAQ, you know, giving examples from, from New Zealand to Singapore to, to, to Europe, you're, you're, you're totally global. So, so maybe if I could turn over to um, uh, Tony first, if you wouldn't mind. So, and thanks, and I would say, uh, to answer your question, actually, is very much in line with what Audrey's last kind of comment was about around data sharing and around kind of data privacy. Like, particularly for myself, we provide technology on a global scale, right? Uh, uh, and then we have customers who are within jurisdictions or across jurisdictions. Uh, we provide services which are potentially located from a server perspective in certain jurisdictions, right? The, the entire aspect around kind of uh, ring fence data, how to use different data, personal privacy, it is a kind of huge logistical kind of aspect. Um, and it's a huge governance aspect, it's a huge technology aspect. It really kind of permeates kind of huge parts of how we develop technology, how we use technology, how we roll that out, right? Um, and so, if there is kind of greater coordination, um, there is greater access uh, uh, across uh, the kind of different jurisdictions, uh, if there are kind of greater standards, that would help us from a, uh, a, a as a provider perspective. And then I would say almost because because my, my background is very much a kind of technology developer background, I would say from a what is possible from a technology development perspective, particularly with these types of technologies that we're talking about, uh, these types of data restrictions kind of limit that possibility quite significantly, right? So I think then when regulators think about these kind of policies, they should also take into account kind of like how, how far they want these kind of uh, technologies to be able to develop. Then also, I mean, particularly in terms of what I focus on, which is anti-financial crime, right? I feel there are significant benefits if there were kind of greater ability to share data across jurisdictions from an anti-financial crime perspective, 
right? And that's not just in terms of a operational efficiency perspective, but that's also from a technology development perspective as well, right? So for me, that, that is the kind of one key aspect that I feel would uh, kind of greatly improve kind of what we can offer. Thank you. Okay. Um, <clears throat> For me, it's now quite easy talking after uh, Tony because he covered uh, a lot of things that that the industry is is very keen to 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 hear or to get as an effort or as a as a benefit from um, a better um, harmonization. So, but let let me summarize maybe in two three sentences what I had in mind for that. It's really about aligned speed, aligned views, and then leading to a better reliability on both ends because it, 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 it's, it's, a, it's a handshake, it's a give and take. And to avoid things like Schrems 2 uh, going forward uh, because their uh, industry relied, power persons relied on, on safe harbors and, and the like, and it was killed twice. And uh, so therefore we really need to see, to get that going forward uh, a bit more um, severe and um, I think, but I see a lot of good, good, good moves already with, with upskilling, with, with uh, more agile mindsets, uh, more alignment. So I think I'm in a good, good mood going forward that this will uh, be uh, able to avoid it, but it's still a journey. So that's, that's my, my magic wall. Thank you. Lu Luciano. Yeah, so thanks for the question, Daniel. Um, basically, I, I totally agree with Tony and, and, and Uwe in, in so far that, um, first of all, it's important that both the regulators and the industry collaborate with each other so that um, policy is directed to where it is needed rather than a blanket approach on everything, you know. Um, with regards to the extent of risk that, that we're looking at, um, obviously, you know, in the course of um, doing our auto supervisory approach, um, the main focus area is that um, our uh, the, the persons operating within the financial services market are fit and proper. And in in that in that in that sense, um, one of the main areas that we have is is competence within the within uh, the governance arrangements of our operators. So, okay, you're using AI, you're using cloud technology, you're using. Um, um, data technology, you know. Um, how is the governance arrangements within our authorized persons, as we call them? Um, how are the risks being monitored? Um, do, does the governance structure understand um, the, the risks that they're dealing with? Um, is it to the benefit of the ultimate consumer, or is it just to, to, to the benefit of the of the authorized person? Um, there is also an issue of of concentration risk as well. So um, we have an issue of uh, third party service providers, um, obviously we have a couple of huge names within the market which operate across a number of jurisdictions, they operate globally and most of our service providers obviously utilize those service providers. So um, what, what, will, what happens should one of these fail? Um, before we used to focus on, on uh, banks as being too big to pay, what if these third party service providers start failing? What happens then? You know, um, there's an issue as well of uh, legal and regulatory risk as well. So as uh, different jurisdictions are moving at different paces and there's different interpretation of, of all the frameworks, as mentioned by Uwe um, earlier, um, there is a certain amount of legal uncertainty obviously um, becomes prevalent in the market. And there's an, also an issue of these technologies being utilized uh, towards uh, a certain level of financial arbitrage. So um, trying to find pockets of arbitrage, of regulatory arbitrage, sorry, uh, trying to find pockets within the market which are unregulated and unsupervised. Um, however, I think one of the main uh, risks that we're facing is that um, we lack um, common data definitions, for example, and uh, common data frameworks. So um, how can we um, as regulators and, and with the market, how can we speak to each other when we cannot, when we do not have a common understanding of what we require? So, um, in terms of data, so how can how can I share and the, the MFSA share data with Mars, for example, um, when we have different 
uh, definitions for certain um, uh, data points. Okay, so having a common understanding of of um, um, uh, data uh, and, and, the, and data governance and data frameworks uh, will allow us to conduct our supervisory process in a more efficient manner and whilst obviously reducing the regulatory burden on the industry. Thank you. And, and lastly, uh, Lee. Uh, thank you. I fully agree. Uh, yeah, I just not to repeat the previous point. I just want to add one more particular point, which is around the risk for the AI machine learning. I, I think the transparency uh, is particular uh, a risk compared with other or traditionally model technologies such as uh, regression models. The transparency here, uh, I think, even from academy, the cutting edge technology, I think, still you know, not reach to the uh, point which is a uh, very satisfied, which meaning the, the new technologies to still need to be developed to um, to show how AI machine learning model works. Because a lot of business use cases without transparency, it is very difficult to convince, uh, you know, FI business users or convince the supervisors. So I think transparency probably is one of the most uh, point. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. So, so, so all of you, so Audrey, uh, Luciano, Lee, uh, Uwe, Tony, thank you very much for your insights and, and uh, joining us today. Um, uh, and again, particularly to you, Tony, for getting up so early to, to be with us this morning. Thank you all very much.